Hi there, I'm Leanne Vanderputten, mother of 11, grandmother of 41 and counting, from Finer Femininity, where I share with you tidbits of old-fashioned goodness and wholesomeness to help us on the path to being joyful, traditional, feminine Catholic women. This article today is taken from the little book, The Wife Desired, by Father Leo J. Kinsella, written in the 1950s. The wife desired is an inspiration to her husband. John was dead tired as he left work for home late one Monday afternoon. His physical fatigue partly accounted for his low spirits. He felt that he was on an economic treadmill. He was getting nowhere. Married five years, he and Eileen and the two little ones were still cooped up in a miserable little four-room birth control trap of a flat. And worst of all, they had saved pitifully little for their own home. It was not like John to quit. John was not giving up this particular Monday night either, yet he was worried about the future. He did not seem to be getting anywhere. He had cast about in his mind for some solution till he was in a mental whirl. Should he look for a part-time job on the side? Should he quit his job, take the plunge, and go in with Joe Burns on that gas station? He hated to vex Eileen with these problems. She had the housework and the children. His was the responsibility of decision. As he reached for the kitchen doorknob, he paused. A dark cloud passed over his face. Eileen had no bargain in him. She was the beauty of her whole school. Intelligent and bubbling over with personality, she could have done much better. As the door swung open, Eileen was wiping a bit of spilled milk from the floor. One knee was on the floor, the other balanced Michael, the culprit whose mess she was cleaning up. Her face came up to meet John's. It was all smiling. The hug and the kiss told him that no one else in all this world was welcome to step through that kitchen door. She noticed that he held her just a little longer than usual. He needs me this evening more than ever, she sensed. And what a comfy feeling to know one is needed. That evening, Eileen fulfilled with colors flying the greatest function of a wife. She was his inspiration. She quickly drove the black devils of defeatism from his troubled mind. Before bedtime, he was ready, like Serrano de Bergerac, to fight giants. Her confidence in him was complete. Not that she did not have to chase out disturbing doubts now and then about his capacities. She was much in love with John and knew his love. This mutual love made it easier for her to discipline her mind, so that her whole being evidenced her assurance in him. Come what might, John was her man, and he was the best in the world for her. Thoughts constant and deep have a way of manifesting themselves, especially to one spiritually tuned in to the thinker. Eileen's faith, quietly evidenced in her husband, renewed his courage. He would not fail her. Eileen was God's manifestation to him of all that was good and beautiful. Like David, the psalmist, he felt that if Eileen was with him, who was against him? Eileen made him conscious that he was the greatest man in the world for her money. There was no pretense in Eileen's admiration for John. She loved him deeply. He was her sunshine, and the light blinded her from seeing anyone else. It was no effort for her to stifle within her soul any invidious comparisons between John and other husbands seemingly more successful. On the surface, the husbands of some of her acquaintances might be more successful. Some of them obviously commanded much more income. So what, fought back Eileen within herself. It takes more than that to make a husband. John may not be on fire, nor the most gifted person, but take him for what he is, he is, all in all, a man. From this brief little picture of Eileen and John, it is obvious that the ideal wife is much more than a companion, a good housekeeper, a good cook, and a good mother. She is an inspiration. Unless she is this to her husband, there is danger that all the other fine aspects of her role as wife will be wasted in final failure. Ability of Wife to Inspire 
The first purpose of this chapter should be to convince all wives that they have been endowed by God with the ability to inspire their husbands. Many wives do not seem to realize their potential power in this respect. It has been a revelation to me to find out how many wives do not have any concept of this important function of a wife. No doubt that is why we are both so unfortunate as to meet at the Chancery. The world is quite a bit what women make it. If our sojourn here is a triumphal parade to the tune of swinging music, to women go the bouquets. If it is a forced march through a veil of tears, to our lady friends go the brickbats. On the one hand, we have our blessed lady. On the other hand, we have to contend with Eve. Women have a way about them of sweeping men onto the heights of nobility or of plunging them into the depth of degradation. To women, God has given a mysterious power of bringing out the best or the worst there is in a man. History and literature reminds us of a multitude of women who activated this latent force within themselves and thus provided the motivation and inspiration of great accomplishments. Men left to themselves too long tend to become rough and brutish. I saw enough of this in the army during the two years overseas with the same outfit. There was something vital missing in the lives of these soldiers. It was the influence of their mothers, their sisters, their wives, and their sweethearts. The deterioration of the soldiers overseas was slow and gradual, but still very definite. The great mass of mankind finds it pretty difficult to climb very much above its environment. An all-male environment is not good for a man over a long period of time. God never intended for the average man to so live. Eve appeared on the scene soon after Adam. The ideal wife gives comfort and encouragement when needed. She is wise with a woman's intuition. So at times she pricks his pride subtly to enable him to rise to some particular situation. Always he has her understanding. She shows her sympathy without being sorry for him. Above all, she never allows him to feel sorry for himself. There are times when she senses that her best contribution is silence. Her presence is all she can give, and it is all he needs. He is upset, out of sorts, confused and angry with himself. She will not add to his turmoil with advice or suggestions. Patiently she waits until he comes down to earth. Sometimes she is at a loss for what to say or do to help him. So she says and does nothing. Her best efforts at inspiration and encouragement may meet with failure and even rebuff. She is human and feels the hurt, but valiant is the word for her. She can be blue and down over his lack of response, but because she is strong of heart, she bounces back with resilience for another day and its tasks. She does not run and hide from problems. If an understanding must be reached over some situation or other, she does not hesitate to thrash the matter out with him. Yet she never needlessly worries him. Some wives worry their husbands into an early grave, they themselves remaining aground to collect the dividends of lonely old age. A good responsible husband was in the habit of going to his office Saturday mornings, even though he had nothing to do there. He said that he just sat at his desk and read the newspaper. If I stay home, my wife will figure out a hundred things for me to do. When he cried on my shoulder about the energy of his wife in planning his Saturdays, his quandary was extreme, for he had just retired and no longer had an office to which to escape. In every home, certain tasks must be performed by the husband. The grass needs cutting, the storm windows have to be put up, and so on. The husband worth anything is aware of these chores properly befalling him. He does not have to be reminded of them, or worse, nagged about them. Things around the house will get out of kilter. An electric socket needs attention. A wheel has come off Junior's wagon. Because the wife is on the scene all week, she will be more aware of these varying little jobs requiring a man's attention. Her objective is to get these odds and ends repaired. Her method will depend on her personality, her intelligence, her understanding of her husband, and her tact, or lack of it. 
She may use a direct approach based on the fact that honey catches more flies than vinegar. Dear, I'll love you all day long if you fix the toaster. The indirect method has its successful adherence. For our example, we will imagine that it is high time a particular Sunday, Saturday morning that the window screens were up for the summer. While the man of the house sleeps late, his wife quietly clouds the bedroom with DDT. If her husband complains as he awakens, she innocently explains that she did not want him to be eaten by mosquitoes, as Patricia Ann was during the night. She never mentions the screens. But it is easy to imagine that the idea of screens is slowly seeping into her husband's befuddled cranium. The shrewd wife is well poised enough to know better than to try to outshine her husband. If she happens to be married to a man of inferior intelligence or education, she will best give evidence of this fact by avoiding the slightest indication of superiority. Indeed, any wife's intellectual ascendancy over her husband could be questioned were she dull enough to strive to lord it over him. If she is clever, she will from time to time approach that big man of hers with some terrific problem which is way beyond the capacities of her little brain. Dear, what do you think I ought to do about this situation? It has me baffled. What is a wife expected to be? Any woman might object to the above advice. A wishy-washy dumb Dora? Is she forever and a day supposed to play up to her husband? Of course not. Much better if she would play with him. A wife does not have to be an open book to her husband. It does not hurt to keep him guessing once in a while. A real man likes to picture his wife as one with spirit and bounce. Because she is intelligent, with a mind of her own, she knows when to maintain a principle, when to be roguish and sportive. Gifted with imagination, she can give herself to the game of intriguing her husband. Always she is exciting and vivacious. The wife loves a little compliment here and there herself, so she knows the value of this form of encouragement. Incidentally, in most marriages heading for the rocks, the couples exchange no compliments. Just the opposite is true between people who seem still to have some sort of possessive love for each other. I do not suppose there exists a married couple who could not concentrate upon and draw up a list of each other's shortcomings. The wise wife knows that there is no future in this mean indoor sport. She counts her blessings. She makes her husband's good points the foundation upon which she strives to help him build improvements. The ideal wife does not mother her husband, yet she knows that he stands alone only with difficulty. Physical or mental pain may drive him to her. She knows how to accept him then with feeling. There is an erroneous idea abroad that women can stand pain much better than men. This is nonsense. I have seen men in military hospitals overseas suffer in silence. I have seen them die painfully in the line of duty without a whimper. Many nurses have told me that their experience is that men suffer and bear pain just as well as women. Then whence comes this widespread false concept? It comes from the observation of our fathers. As children, we received our first impressions of men from our fathers. And our fathers were notorious for raising a terrible howl of pain when anything happened to them. Why? Simply because our mothers were nearby. Toward the end of his days, a man can look back upon his life and find no greater accomplishment than his full success as a husband and father. All his varied activities possessed significance, really meant something only in relation to his role as husband and head of the house. If he had great success in the cheap sense of the word and became very rich, but was a failure as a husband, what contentment is there in the last recollections of his life? What success, real or fictitious, can compensate for his failure as a husband? No woman can escape sharing her husband's misery or his contentment and peace. If she has contributed to his making, to her comes the reward of real happiness. No wife hurts her husband more than she hurts herself. No wife makes her husband happier than she makes herself. Lest anyone think that sly reference here is being made to unfaithfulness on the part of wives, let us clear the decks of any such obstructions to understanding what is meant. 
I believe that I am in a good position to make the statement that, relatively speaking, very few wives are unfaithful. Men have much more cause to hang their heads in shame on this score. However, there are other ways in which a woman can bring out the worst in a man, other ways in which she can drive him to distraction, if not to destruction. Thank you for tuning in today. Come and visit me at my Finer Femininity website. I have a Facebook page too, where I share with you inspirations of all kinds. I also have lots of beautiful handcrafted items in my Meadows of Grace shop. Look for those links in the description below. May God bless you and Our Lady cover you with her mantle. Saint Anne, pray for us.